and welcome to The Greenwich Show, the only show that's devoted to the Royal Borough of Greenwich. On this month's programme, it's Behind You. We go behind the scenes at rehearsals for the Greenwich Theatre Pantomime. This show really is about this area and this community, and I, I think that's a great thing as well, and people get to know us and we get to know them. We go mudlarking on the Thames River Bank. One of the things that I have found quite a lot of uh, along this stretch of foreshore is uh, some messages in bottles. We find out about business ventures born out by an old school friendship. Greenwich was the sort of place that shone out for us, and which was a really, really lucky for us because it's a perfect place for a small neighbourhood restaurant. We take a look inside a mini bar in the borough. I converted my kitchen and I had some cupboards left over and for a joke I put them in there and just sort of realised I've actually got a bar. I think that the police should stop targeting black people because... Just like that? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we find out about The Big Talk, a new urban discussion which was launched in the borough. Welcome to the November episode of The Greenwich Show and thank you very much for tuning in and all your very kind comments. They're much appreciated. Well, it's that time of year again, and Greenwich Theatre is in rehearsal for its annual pantomime. The best pantomime in the country. Well, I think so, anyway. So we sent our cameras to rehearsals to see what you're going to be getting this year. The annual pantomime at the Greenwich Theatre is as good as engraved into their calendar each year. Oh, yes, it is. And this year, for their performances of Jack in the Beanstalk, they've added extra dates by popular demand. I think it's a fantastic show. I think we, we do the best we can. Everybody in this building um, puts all their energy into making this show as, as, as good as we can, and we've built that up. <laughs> Although we're in London, this show it really is about this area and this community and I, I think that's a great thing as well and people get to know us and we get to know them and it is, it's not just a, a show that's come from somewhere else that you bang into a, a theatre, we create it for this community. The cast have been in rehearsal since the final week of October so whilst we leave them to rehearse ahead of opening night on the 20th of November we've come to meet the artistic director here at the theatre. Hello, James. How ah, lovely to see you. To see you, Robert. What are you doing? You're rummaging through the thing. <laughs> I, I didn't know artistic directors did that. Is well. that what they do? <laughs> Not often, but I think panto season is one of the perks, probably, is come down and see what's, what's going on. And these are some of the costumes for Jack in the Beanstalk, is That's it? That's right. We don't want to give too much away this year, but um, people are busy making away. It's one of the things we do every year. All the costumes are made new. There's no recycling here. Everything people see is brand new. We've spent a lot of time and put a lot of work into building our family audience. We have a, a big national reputation now for work for families and probably the, the biggest moment for that to be seen is pantomime. It's the longest run of any show all year. It brings in the most people of any show all year by a long way. About 20,000 people will come and see this show. I always used to say that the thing I really wanted to find in theatre was the sort of theatrical equivalent of Doctor Who, where every generation would sit down together and watch it. There's something really exciting and really special about that. There are loads of brilliant children's shows out there that are lovely for four-year-olds and the parents just glaze over and let it happen. Panto, and especially Panto here, is not like that. It really engages every generation. Teenagers love it, three-year-olds love it, so it's really special to us. Back at rehearsals, and the cast are looking forward to getting going. They don't have any celebrities in this Panto, it's just a traditional family pantomime, and um, it's really successful as well. Like, I've... Um, I spoke to some of my friends, I've said, oh, I'm doing Greenwich Panto this year, and they say, wow, it's amazing. It's, it's got a lovely reputation uh, in, in the area and, and, and around, and um, it's always done really well. It's always got great actors playing great characters, and it's got a nice um, traditional feel to it. So it's more, I, feel, I, I don't know, I find it more inviting than maybe a, a star studied, like, you know, ooh, come and see this person. It's more like, just come and have a good time. 
we sort of maybe do have one celebrity, although we announce that we are celebrity free. Andrew Pollard plays our Dane. He's been with us now as performer for nine years and as writer for 10 years. So he's started to be recognised a lot. People come and see the show because they love Andy Pollard. The expectation goes up and so you do feel a bit of a pressure to try and get a better and better show. But we've got, we've got some really, really great singers this year. We've got, and usually, you know, we tend to do pop songs rather than musical theatre. And we've, had, we've got a couple of people who've been in West End musicals. So we've got really strong singers. But I think Jack of the Beanstalk is a, the, one of the best stories. We've got a giant, you know, and you build up to, to revealing this giant and we have a great giant. I think, it, you know, it, I haven't seen one as good as this, I have to say, uh, anywhere. I think it's a fantastic uh, giant. And so what can we expect from Jack in the Beanstalk this season? Let's meet some of the characters, shall we? I'm Dame Trot, and uh, I've got a son, Jack, who's uh, about to have a big adventure, so I hear. Yes, we're, uh, he's going to go up a beanstalk, if it grows. Uh, we're going to get the manure in, of course. Um, but I'm, I'm poor. My name's Nightshade, and um, I work for the giant Bone Cruncher. So I've been sent down to the town, yeah, because I've got to collect rent off people, yeah? Because they're not paying their rent. So I've got to come collect it. I'm a widow, yes. So I'm on the hunt for a man round Greenwich this year. Yes, that's, that's my favourite bit, trying to find somebody to, uh, to, well, to keep me warm in the winter, yes. No one likes someone who has to collect rent, innit? But, you know, I've got to do what i got to do. I don't care if you don't like me or not. But yes, we're going to go on a, a big adventure to meet a big giant. Yeah, and he is big, let me tell you. Yes, he's a big boy. He's angry, he's angry, he's always hungry, man. I've, I've, there's a cook up there, yeah? And he's got to cook all the food for him all the time, so I... I've got to give him the money to make the food because he eats a lot, isn't it? Well, I've got a little tumble-down shack. You know, the, the, the prices, the rent round here is terrible, isn't it? You know, so I do what I can. But I've got a little house and we've got a cow, Daisy. And uh, so that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a milkmaid, really. Yes, yes, you know what milkmaids are like. <laughs> We're poor, but we have a good time. You know, you've got, you've got to have a laugh, haven't you, when you haven't got much money. So uh, we make our own entertainment. But yes, I'm fun-loving. I am, I'm fun-loving. And uh, I've got a big heart, yes. <laughs> Well, it looks like everything's in place for another hugely successful panto season here at the Greenwich Theatre. It is a delight to be here at Christmas. It's, people come back year after year and they write us letters and they, you know, and you see them on the street and it, it's a, you know, there's, I, I don't know anything else like that, you know, that I, especially that I do in the year. That, there's a real special feel about it and, you know, we take it very seriously. We, we really work hard. We don't phone it in, we don't throw it on. Everything is made specially every year. For, for us, it's, a, it's about ensemble. It's about really good, solid uh, performers delivering a great show. And I think in terms of that, we're, we are one of the best. Well, I think it's going to be another great show at the Greenwich Theatre this year. It starts on November the 20th, so get your tickets soon. They go like hotcakes. Talking of pantomime, there is the Greenwich Pantomime Horse Race. This year it's to be called the London Pantomime Horse Race. And last month the team were out shooting a promo for the event. This year we'll have a bit of a different look, with it having a Star Wars theme. It's all happening on Sunday the 14th of December. It's not often you see scenes like this in the borough. They're hoping for a big crowd for the event this year and are planning to make the event still bigger. The horse race um, has been, now it's in its fifth year. Um, it started off with, uh, I think, four horses and then a random horse turned up out of blue. It's caught uh, people's imaginations, which is great. Um, for the pure sight of how absurd it looks uh, every year. We, we try and raise money for uh, Demelza Children's Hospice. So it's a very, very serious message. But uh, we do it to raise money in the most absurd, fun way. Every year is a theme, um, and this year, as it's the fifth, I thought, messing around with the word Sith, we will have a Star Wars theme. So if uh, all goes to plan, um, we're going to have a Darth Vader, potentially a hundred stormtroopers, an R2-D2 unit. We've got some people behind it who want to make it even more ridiculous than I could possibly imagine. Well, good luck to all the runners and riders, and may the horse be with you. Well, we love hearing your stories at the Greenwich Show of what you're up to. 
and we've got a great story here about a lady who walks along the riverbank and finds treasure. We put our reporter Phoebe Kibbe on the case. The Thames is London. The way it snakes over the northern part of the borough defines the borough boundaries. And when the water recedes, there is often much treasure to be found. Every low tide brings fresh debris to the banks, rubbish scattered and strewn in an order, albeit random, only nature could dictate. Now as children we all dream about how lovely it would be to find some secret treasure amongst this rubbish here on the beach. Now I've met someone who actually finds messages in bottles almost every day. Nicola White is a mudlarker who patrols the banks of the river and finds many things. Mudlarking is looking for little pieces of history, pieces of treasure on the foreshore of the River Thames. It's the secret stories of all the little things that I find. It's just fascinating to think of the stories that these things have. What things have you found whilst mudlarking? Um, I found a lot of old coins, buttons, military cap badges, a lot of Victorian things and I did also find part of a human skeleton along with a jawbone a um, little further down the river which we then reported to the police and it was probably from about the 1650s. And can anyone go mudlarking? You have to have a licence from the Port of London Authority. You don't need a licence if you're just walking along the foreshore and looking, but once you start scraping, it's absolutely imperative that you have a licence. Great. Well, should we go and have a look at what you found? Yes, absolutely. So, Nicola, what have we got here? Well, one of the things that I have found quite a lot of uh, along this stretch of foreshore is uh, some messages in bottles. You know, I'm actually amazed how many you have here. I know, I've got about 40 now. It's so exciting because, especially now in this era of emails and texts, it's not often that you actually get a handwritten letter. Absolutely. So it's really quite exciting. The first message I found was from a little boy called Finn Q, who's 12, and he actually lives on a barge further up the river in Southwark. This is one of my unsolved mysteries. It's from a little girl called Madison. It's Madison. It just says Madison. It says, hello, my name is Madison. I live in London. I'm eight years old. I put a note in a bottle and would like the person who finds it to let me know where it was found. And I have tweeted it out several times, but so far, no luck. This one is a bit of fun. I like this one. Yes. It says, try everything at least once, except, you know, illegal stuff. Duh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Daniel of Canary Wharf. That's brilliant. Great advice there from Daniel yeah, yeah. of Canary Wharf. Again, I don't know who Daniel is, no. but it uh, would be great to find out. Yeah. <laughs> there is one that I really yeah, would like to have an answer to. Okay. And it's these two very curious messages I found in two separate bottles, actually, on the same day. And they're just fingerprints and some Chinese writing. Wow. And that's all there is on them but it would be great to have a little bit of background on, mm. on the meaning of these. They're absolutely fascinating, Nicola. Do you reckon we're going to find any messages in bottles here today? Uh, looking at the conditions, probably not. I can't see a lot of debris washed up, but there's no harm in trying. Let's go and have a look. Okay, great. Right. So what are we actually looking for here? Generally, what you find along the banks of the River Thames reflects the activities that, that went on along it. And for example, here, there's a lot of shipbuilding um, right. that went on. Also here, there's quite a lot of military pieces, old spent bullets, um, cat badges, sort of World War II really, left, left over from there. Really, it's about getting your eye in. You'd be surprised how much you can find in just a tiny area. So we've had a good look, but unfortunately not found anything today. Not really the right conditions, or? No, it's a bit sludgy, which means uh, it's very difficult to see what's on the surface. So we've seen how dangerous it can be this morning, potentially getting stuck in the mud here. How safe is it? Uh, well, you've got to be very aware of your surroundings. It's advisable when mudlarking to go with another person for obvious reasons. The Thames is tidal, the tide can come up very quickly, the mud can be deep. There are groups that do do mudlarking. There's a group called the Thames in the Field, which you can get involved with, where you go with a group of people who are experts who can give you advice. So if you're thinking of mudlarking, it's probably quite a good idea to get involved with an organised group. Well, thank you, Nicola. It's been absolutely fascinating. I definitely think I'm going 
going to join a group or perhaps come again with you sometime <laughs> and hopefully find a message in a bottle next time. Excellent. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Anytime. Thanks. Thank <laughs> Fascinating stories there. I love the messages in the bottle. Well, if you've got any stories you'd like us to cover, get in touch. Coming up next on The Greenwich Show, we look at public houses, large and small, and look at a new style of urban discussion launched in the borough. I love Greenwich because it has more of the things that make London great in it and less of the things that make it annoying. You're watching an owl, now a jellyfish, and there's his friend. Many others are looking at this too, but they could be looking at your business. Advertise with The Greenwich Show and put your business in front of a captive audience of residents and tourists. Check out thegreenwichshow.co.uk Oh, and there's a butterfly. I like Greenwich because it's so diverse. It's like an individual pocket of London. Welcome back to the November episode of The Greenwich Show. Many of you have launched businesses in Greenwich. This is a story of two school friends who, through their love of art, design and cooking, have joined forces and a few years ago launched an amazing business in Greenwich. Well, it was originally designed and built by a captain um, as a house, as his house, um, hence the kind of nautical shape. It's about 1780. Unfortunately, just as he finished it, he died. His wife didn't want it. And then around 1806, she sold it to the kind of beginnings of the Truman Brewery. And since that time, it's been a pub. And there's a bit of uh, Greenwich information. Yeah, so, um... exactly. So we feel you know, we feel a responsibility to the area and the building. With an old school friend, did, or yes. not so old, no, same uh, age, John. Actually. We're born on the same day as me. No, we? well, yes. how about that? That was in Seven Oaks in Kent. That was, yeah, we'd been friends since we were 14, something like that. We talked about doing something, you know, that involved space, involved food, um, you know, and then we kind of, you know, the more we talked about it, the more it became sort of something we actually could do. Greenwich was the sort of place that shone out for us. Um, and which was a really, really lucky for us because it's a perfect place for a small neighbourhood restaurant. And it's food, space and art. What was the attraction of doing a business and property together? Well, a lot of it is the responsibility to the local area. So it's actually this building when we, when we bought it was in really bad state of disrepair. Everything from the external condition, this room was completely derelict. We never really closed, we never really opened. We kind of just, you know, Work, worked as, as we went. We were, we were fairly sure of what we wanted to create, but um, it was a big, big project. Primarily, we, I saw this as, a, as restoring a really important local building. It's firstly a pub. What we want to do is we want to have a, a combination of simple dishes and um, some sort of more dishes with a bit more finesse. We'd never done anything of this size before. Jo John's done s uh, similar stuff in a, for, in a property way, but combined with a business, we'd never done anything this, this big. How to make it what people in the area want, but also attract people that are visiting the area, so that it, you know, it, it's 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 an offering that can stand on its own. It's, it's not just because it's in Greenwich that it's busy. It's the quality of the food. What an interesting look of what it takes to actually set up a pub. Well, talking of pubs and space, another Greenwich residence has taken it to the extreme. I am Greg. I run Dude's Bar, probably the smallest bar in the country, more likely in London, most definitely the smallest bar in Greenwich. There's a lot of work that has gone into this, from um, the big things to the very small things. Um, something can take me five minutes, something can take me a month. I just hope my wife don't see this, but it's probably about £5,000. It all started a few years ago when we converted a room in our old house, and um, this is it here. It was a very, very cold room, and it actually started off when um, all my beers was actually a little more colder than the fridge. So I, I put all my drinks in there, I converted my kitchen, 
and I had some cupboards left over and for a joke I put them in there and just sort of realised I've actually got a bar. The first thing I actually went and got was the mirrors, they're sort of bar mirrors, I wanted something to, you know, officially a bar. These things are generally from pubs that I pick up um, or give them to me as, as I go around. The dartboard, um, the fruit machine, um, all, all the drinks that are up here with the, um, the bell and the optics, um, the jukebox, um, how I've done the lighting, um, even things down to bar stalls, you know, genuinely things that you would find in a bar. I just wanted to make it so when you walk in, it's, it is like a mini pub. That was my idea originally, that's exactly what I wanted, and I think that's exactly what, what I've got. We've got just about every drink possible here. We've got beers, we've got spirits, we've got cocktails, but hardly any soft drinks. We've had so many brilliant nights. It's, um, it's a lot cheaper than going to the pub. You certainly ain't got to walk home and call cabs and things like that. It's literally fall out of here at three o'clock in the morning and into bed. Yeah, and everything in here is from, from our trips all around the world. Um, for instance, I've got a bit of Titanic up here. And this is um, from our trip to Auschwitz. And along here is um, a recent trip to Paris, where there's actually a snail that I ate. My most prized possession has to be my Maria Sharapova ball. It's a ball that was given to me by Maria Sharapova when we went to Wimbledon a couple of years ago and I asked for a ball after a practice session. Everyone that comes over comes in, loves the bar, and I, I very much have the, the, the like wow factor. Probably the most I think we had in here we sort of counted um, was about 18 people. And I was very worried about my floor. <laughs> Last orders please. <laughs> and don't forget, all visitors have to sign the guest book, including the Greenwich Show. Well, who'd have thought Greg had that at the bottom of his garden? Next time I'm passing, I may just pop in. Now, Rebecca from Greenwich Mums is looking at the Greenwich Show's Greenwich Guide of all that's going on this month. Hello and welcome to another look at what's going on in this month. Here's our guide to November. On the 15th and 16th of November, the Second Floor Studios is holding an Open Studios Weekend. The social enterprise company supports art projects by offering studios and workspaces. The Open Studio runs from 11 until 6pm on both days at their studios near Woolwich. On Sunday the 16th of November, singer-songwriter Kaz Simmons brings her new trio for its EFG London Jazz Festival debut. The trio will play fresh arrangements of songs spanning Kaz's four albums, as well as songs by the likes of Rufus Wainwright, Scott Matthews and Nina Simone. Mycenae House are hosting two comedy events, the first their Comedy Club on the 21st of November and features Stuart Goldsmith, Eric Lampart and Patrick Moynihan. Then, on the 29th of November, they host the Hobgoblin Comedy Awards, the London regional leg of a 22-venue national comedy tour, featuring a selection of the best emerging comics. Tickets for both events are available from their website, mycenehouse.co.uk. As the festive season approaches, Christchurch on Trafalgar Road are holding their Christmas gift fair on Saturday the 29th of November. There's stalls, gifts and cards as well as children's activities. The Pleasant Pleasants Market returns to Pistachios Cafe at East Greenwich Pleasants on the 30th of November. So, that's our look at top events in the borough this November. If you've got an event that you'd like us to feature, then please send us all the details and any footage if you have it to info at thegreenwichshow.co.uk. Well, thanks, Rebecca, and I'm sure you'll all be very busy in the month to come. Well, we always like to include a film that you've made, and this month we've got a film about a new style of urban discussion in the borough. The Big Talk is a groundbreaking youth discussion. It's a discussion with swag. It gives young people, urban young people the opportunity to have their voices heard by important people in our society, such as business leaders and politicians. Uh, it is inspired by Simone Circle. You have three circles. The inner circle is where the discussion takes place, the, the middle circle is where you listen, and um, the outer circle is where you participate in the discussion via social media. The film that you're going to see is an extract from an event that took place at Ravensbourne, filmed by 
Ravens Bond graduates. Really want to get everyone involved in this debate. This is what you're here for. You're not here to sit in your chairs. You're here to get up and actually get to say something to people who can make a difference. I guess the question that we've been asked tonight, and that I hope to learn as much as you people about this, um, is what is the future for Stop and Search? Like for me, I've had a lot of issues with Stop and Search growing up. A big issue around Stop and Search is the way that police are trained towards Stop and Search because they all seem to enter Stop and Search with a preconception of what's going to happen. Ever since the police have been around, which is about 185 years, there's been a power to stop and search people. Uh, and the same power existed for most of that time. A good reason that they would usually say is that you fit a description or that we've got intelligence, but a lot of the time that's kind of made up and it can be very easily, the situations can be very easily manipulated by police officers, so I think it should be a lot more stringent towards the police officers uh, that are doing this stop and search. Basically, all a police officer needed was they just had to suspect you up to no good. I think that the police should stop targeting black people, because... Just like that, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If like a black man and a Caucasian man was walking, they would target the black man when the Caucasian man has like the illegal products. Oh, so you think it's the police that need to do anything? Is, it, is there anything that you think you can actively do to change that perception? Stop dressing to their stereotype. Ah. That's an interesting point because that's been a recurring theme throughout the history of the problems with stop and search. Just looking at my own borough at the moment, if you are a black person, you are still about 50% more likely to be stopped and searched than if you're a white person per thousand head of population. So that's not kind of, oh, there's a bigger black community here or there's a bigger white community there. That is actually looking at it as a proportion. So there is a disproportionality there. Conversely, as an Asian person, you're about 30% less likely to be stopped than a white person. Why that is, I can't claim to know. Are we aware of it now? I think, yes, we have to uphold the law. Now, the law is created by politicians. We don't have a say in the law, but we will uphold it. How we do that, however, is something that we can control. So I'd be interested in any views about what we can do to address some of those issues. Bending the truth, warping our minds honestly. Got me feeling peak when I'm deep in philosophy. So I hold up and wait, wait a, a minute. minute. If he makes the beats, then I write the lyrics. Positive vibes all the time, no gimmick. So that's why we give it. 100%, 100%, 100%. I said hold up. Wait, Wait a minute. minute, if he makes the beats then I write the lyrics Positive vibes all the time, no gimmicks So that's why we give it 100%, 100% The plan for the next Big Talk event, March 2015 is to invite the main UK party leaders into the inner circle to face big questions. Well, that's it for this month's The Greenwich Show, and thank you for watching. We'll be back with a new series very soon. The best place to find out all about The Greenwich Show is our website, thegreenwichshow.co.uk. You'll find all the details on there.